in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 and 16 it says for we have in high we have not in high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points te tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need this morning for a little while I want to speak on this topic damaged goods we like to go to a store and especially the clearance aisle because in that clearance aisle there'll be a, a blemish on a product or something and it's marked down damaged out of stock going out and we think we got ourselves a deal one day little boy was walking down the street the owner of a shop put up a sign and the sign said this puppies for sale puppies for sale so the little boy walks in he walks in and he says how much are the puppies and the owner says I will not sell them for less than fifty dollars a piece little boy reaches in his pocket and he pulls out the money that he had which was two dollars and thirty seven cents he lays it on the counter he says can I see the puppies he said yeah the owner whistled and when he whistled the mom mother dog came out her name was lady and out behind her came five bounding little balls of fur four of them came running out very quickly and one came hobbling out the little boy said what's wrong with that puppy right there why is it limping he said it limps today he said because it has no hip socket we took it to the veterinarian and it has no hip socket at all he said he's not for sale the little boy says that's the one I want and the man says you can't have that one I won't sell him to you he's not worth anything he limps and the boy got very indignant he got right in his face and he says I want that dog that puppy right there that limps and the owner says I'll give him to you you don't have to buy him I'll give him to you he looked at him and he said absolutely not he's worth as much as he all the other puppies are and he reaches in his pocket again and he lays the two dollars and 37 cents on the counter he says I will give you this and I'll pay you 50 cents a month until I pay for the puppy he said you don't understand little boy he's never gonna run he's never gonna jump he's never gonna have a good time with its owner he can't function like everybody else and the little boy reached down and looked the man straight in the eye and he reached down and grabbed his pant leg and he pulled it up and showed him a twisted leg that was held together by two pieces of metal so he could walk straight he says I understand that puppy damaged goods and we look at things and we say damaged goods but understand something today you have a God in heaven that understands your damaged goods he gets you 
in all your failures and all your bumps and bruises and all this stuff going on, God gets you. And the world looks at you and says, you're nothing but damaged goods. And says, God says, uh -uh, that's my boy. That's my girl over there. I get them over there. And the world has kicked you in the teeth and left you on the side of the road because you have nothing to offer to them anymore. And the world puts a sign on your neck, says, you're no good, damaged goods. The preacher that's preaching to you has had that sign placed on his neck a time or two, damaged goods. I didn't make all, all the right decisions in the world growing up, damaged goods. I didn't hang out with the right people, damaged goods. I didn't do the right thing, damaged goods. Say the right thing, damaged goods. But when you come to the cross and you come to the foot of the cross, you are no longer damaged goods. You are no longer damaged goods. I don't care what anybody's ever said about you. I don't care what's going on. The writer of Hebrews in our text tells us explicitly that the high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weakness. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but he was without sin. He gets you damaged goods. He understands your damaged goods. He goes out of his way to find out where those damaged goods are and starts bringing them in and says, let me tell you what you're able to do. Not what the world tells you you can't do. Not what your family tells you you can't do. Not what the church tells you you can't do. Let me show you what you're able to do. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. God takes damaged goods and he makes them good. God gets those damaged goods and says, bring them on into the house of God. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a word that we call restoration. Jesus, who became sin, that we might overcome sin, paid the full price for us. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. Let me explain to you what took place on Calvary that day. Jesus became sin he became sin he who knew no sin brother bowler that day he became sin for you and for me he didn't know any sin at all but that day they laid upon him all the sin of humanity from the time adam was was created to the very last child and jesus became damaged goods but he understood. Hebrews 5 and 2 says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. He gets you. Just as that little boy reached down, Sister Hall, and pulled up his pant leg and showed a twisted leg and for, a, for a, a, a boy who couldn't walk. Don't tell me that boy hadn't had situations going on in his mind. If he liked baseball, he was probably the last one that everybody picked at that point because Johnny can't run. Johnny can't do this. Johnny can't do that. So he walks into that pet store owner's shop that day, Brother Posey, and sees that little puppy limping and says that's the one I want that's the one I want why because he understood what that puppy was going through because he couldn't walk either damaged goods yesterday I sat in the funeral of sister Gassandi and I have known the Gassandi family as I said yesterday for 40 years I met brother Mike Gassandi at a landmark conference when he asked me to come and preach for him. He didn't know who I was. I wasn't even known. I didn't, nobody knew who I was, which was fine with me. 
He walks up to me and says, I'd like for you to come and preach for me. I get done preaching that Sunday morning. Sister Cassandy walks up to me and says, oh, you did just a wonderful job. And I'm thinking, what planet did God just put you on? I don't even know how to preach. I don't know anything about homiletics. I taught homiletics for 10 years, way down the line, years later. Couldn't even spell homiletics back then. Still have a hard time with it. And she walked, you did such a wonderful job. Just a great job. You got to be kidding me. I remember coming on 300 Hillborn right after Jeanette and I were married. And I'd preach at Hillborn. And there was always a, a, a fan favorite that was there. And she looked at me and she would say, oh, that was the best message I ever heard in my life. In my mind, I'm going, liar, liar, pants on fire. You got to be kidding me. But to her, it was. Her name was Edna Francis. Oh, Brother Bishop, that was so good. That was, I'm going, you got to be kidding me. Damaged goods. And what Brother Mike Cassandi said was his wife had an inferior complex inferiority complex about other individuals other preachers wives and she never felt like she could measure up and as I'm sitting there God is talking to me about this message right here but person after person after person stood up and said this is what she did in my life in her mind she was damaged goods in God's mind, she was the clay that the potter was molding, that the potter was making, saying, don't call anything unclean that which I have cleansed. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible has to do with a woman, an adulterous woman. And maybe I get it because of where my background comes from and who my mother was. But I get this woman in the book of Mark. I get her. Jesus is there and they come to Jesus. Who comes to Jesus? The religious people come to Jesus. The church going people come to Jesus. And they looked at Jesus and they said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say? Basically what they were saying was she's damaged goods. She's no use to nobody. She's no good to anybody anymore. Nobody wants her as a husband. Nobody even wants her as a girlfriend. She's just used for their pleasure and thrown away. Damaged goods. The Bible doesn't say that they even gave her a a cloth to put over her nakedness. They just said they took her out of the bed of adultery. She was in the very act of adultery. And they took her out of the bed and they threw her down at the feet of Jesus. And then he looked at Jesus and what do you say? Here's where my God shines. Here's where he just shines. He gets down on the ground and he starts writing something on the ground. I don't know what he wrote. Scripture doesn't tell us what he wrote. And then he gets down a second time, writes on the ground. And this time when he gets up, there's nobody there. He looks at this woman. He said, woman, where are thine accusers? She said, there are none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. He wasn't giving her a pass. Listen to me. He didn't give her a pass. What he did was he released her to repent. He looked at her and said, society says you're damaged goods, but not to me. I have a purpose in your life. I've got a purpose for you. 
And there you may be here today and maybe church and preachers and saints of old have looked at you and said, there's no use for you. You're damaged goods. You've walked into a place where the preacher himself was damaged goods. And if God can look at me and say, I still have a purpose for you, then God has a purpose for you today. I love the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. It's the beginning of the church. But there are some things that I really like in the book of Acts, like Acts chapter 10, where we become so self-righteous. And it's like, look what I got on. Look what I was wearing today. Look where I live. Look what I drive. My kids were, and I were talking about this the other day. When I left Stockton in 1998 to go to Wisconsin, I was driving a 19... 94, 1995, Buick Skylark. Excuse me, 1993, Buick Skylark. It was burgundy, it was nice. And uh, while I was here, everything was great. Took that out to Wisconsin. And uh, I had to start parking at the back 40 of their parking lots. But the how the... The, the starter had gone out in the car. And so I didn't park it right up in the front because I knew that I had to get the cardboard out of the back seat or out of the trunk. And I put it on the ground and took a screwdriver and touched the two things and it would start the, 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 the vehicle. But bless God, you don't want anybody to know that because you're the preacher. You're the man of faith. So you park it in the back 40 because you don't want anybody to see what's going on. Well, unbeknownst to me, a dear friend of mine by the name of John Soto saw what was taking place, and he never said a word to me. He looked at my car. He looked at the tires on my car, and I was going to camp for the very first time with four bald tires and a starter that I had to crawl underneath there in my suit to start the car. While I was in camp, somehow he got my keys because a lot of times I don't put them in my pocket. I put them on the seat. He got my keys. He took my car. He had four brand new tires put upon it. He had a new starter put in it. And then he brought it back and put my keys back down and never said a word to me. Put it back where it was parked at in the campground because I didn't want anybody to see where I was parking my car. Damaged goods. My pride was more important than anything else. Hello? I want people to look at me a certain way because when you got damaged goods, you want people to look at you in the right manner. But God pulls all that mess of, uh, away from us and says, you know what, I just want you to be real. I want you to be you. I want you to be authentic. And maybe you're here today and everyone else has looked at you as damaged goods. God will never look at you as damaged goods because to God you're not damaged goods. To God you have a purpose. For that woman pulled out of the very bed of adultery, she had a purpose. Put her pride aside. Put everything else aside. Quit want, wanting to keep up with the Joneses and let's just look at God the way God looks at us. People look at us like damaged goods, but God doesn't look at us that way. People look at us because of the way they want us to be, but God doesn't look at us that way. And all of a sudden, now the very woman caught in the act of adultery was now talking to Jesus. But there's something about that story that you have to understand. It doesn't tell it in the Bible. You have to, un you have to know it. And you have to know a little bit about the law of Moses. To understand this woman that was thrown at the feet of Jesus as damaged goods. You see, the law of Moses stated that if there was an individual that was in her situation, you couldn't just throw her down at the feet of Jesus. You had to bring the man as well. And the question that besets me is simply this. If you brought the woman, where was the man? Where was the man? Maybe he was one of the individuals that was standing there around them getting ready to stone the damaged goods woman. Hello? 
Hello? And when Jesus was done, all there was was just a woman. And he looks at her and says, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. What is Jesus saying to her? I've been in your shoes. I know how you feel. But this is what I love. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's what the scripture says. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. God shows grace even though we are not gracious. God shows mercy even though we don't deserve the mercy. God still shows the grace and the mercy to us. Why? Because he gets you. He understands. I don't care if you've been born and raised and cut your teeth on the pew in front of you. God gets you. Or you just came into the church today. God gets you. The world looks at you as damaged goods, but God will never look at you as damaged goods. What about the individual, not only this woman caught in the act of adultery, but what about, she's the New Testament. We love preaching about the New Testament. Let's go all the way back to the Old Testament then. He was just a young boy. Most of us can't even pronounce his name. His name is Mephibosheth. He was a son of Jonathan. He was Saul's grandson. He was a prince in the palace, if you would. Mephibosheth, I told you you can't even say it. Mephibosheth had everything going for him. He didn't want for anything. But one day when they were running against or running away from the enemy, his nurse dropped him. And he landed on his feet. And from that day forward, he was lame in his feet. He was grandson of a king. Son of a prince. He was a prince himself. But he was lame in his feet. And all that Saul was ever interested in was killing David. David never did that to Saul, would never do that because he would not put his hand to God's anointed. But when Saul and his sons were murdered and killed, David got to thinking, is there one person that I can show kindness to? Just one. Because when the kingdom changed hands, normally all of the posterity of that former king were killed. They were annihilated. And someone said, yeah, there's one that's left of the household of Saul. And David said, who is it? He said, his name is Mephibosheth. You see, the name Mephibosheth means shame. It actually means shameful one. Now he can't walk. And so David looks and says, you bring him to me. And you can't tell me that Mephibosheth was not in fear of his own life. He comes in, head bowed low to the king. And all of a sudden, David looks at him. And he looks at him, and this is what he says. I'll put it in terms that we understand. You might be damaged goods, Mephibosheth, but understand something. I'm going to show you some kindness today. And he looked at Mephibosheth. He said, from now on, you will eat at my table. You'll eat at my table. And all those individuals that were of your father and your grandfather. They're going to take care of your fields for you, but you're going to eat at my table from now on. Everybody looked at Mephibosheth and said, damaged goods, no good. But David said, I see value in him. I start looking around this room, and I won't call names. I start looking around this room, and I start remembering when people walked down the aisle, stood at this altar with their hands raised, because somebody somewhere along the line looked at you and said, you're no good. Damaged goods is what you are. All washed up. Nothing there for you. I'm looking around going, God, look what you have done. Don't call anything unclean or uncommon that which God has cleansed. And that's why I love Acts chapter 10 so, so much. Because if we're not careful, hear me and hear me well, beloved. If we're not careful, what we have is we get a self-righteous mentality Look at me. I was born and raised in church. I got this great long heritage in church. 
And then all of a sudden you see an individual, like I did just the other day, who was laying right out here in the doorway of our church, and that's where she slept that night. I know her name. Sister Bishop befriended her a year or so ago now. I couldn't get in the door, so I walked down the front. Somebody would look and say, get out of our doorway. Move that cardboard box. Get that cat food out of the way and move the water. Because during the week, I had to get the cat food out of the way and move the water. Because she forgot to do it. Did I kick her out of the doorway? No, I didn't kick her out of the doorway. Don't shoot the wounded. We need them more than ever. They need our love no matter what it is they've done. Sometimes we just condemn them and don't take time to hear their story. Don't shoot the wounded. Someday you might be one. It's an old song that we used to sing a long, long time ago on the radio. And the man who wrote that song sat in my office and I said, what purpose you to, and, and drove you to drive this, to write this song? He said, it was adversity that I, gone, uh, that I went through and people pointed their finger at me and said, it's because of this, 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 and this, when it was not true at all. Damaged goods. Job understands what it's like to have damaged goods. It wasn't Job that he did anything wrong. It was God's idea, not Job's. Yet friends of, of his comes along and says, oh, it must be because you've done this, 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 and this. And even his own wife said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? And by the time it was over, Job had twice as much as what he started out with. Damaged goods. But Sergio, where are you at? Raise your hand. One of the neatest nights that I can remember in a very long time happened on a Monday night, not a Sunday morning. It happened on a Monday night right here in the sanctuary. It was birthday night. In my truck, I keep that coin in the center of my console, and I see it every day. And I look at it and say, God, I thank you because of what you've done in my life. And for some of you who weren't here, it was birthday night. There were 60 some people that were here and individuals that God had delivered from alcoholism and drugs and self-harm and all this other kind of stuff. My daughter comes to me, my youngest, and she looks at me and she says, Daddy, she says, can I go up there or is this just for individuals who've been on drugs and alcohol. I said, no, it's for anybody who's gone on, been involved with vices. She says, dad, she says, it's been seven years. Seven years, dad, since I did any self-harm. And what a lot of you don't know is we don't have some silver spoon hanging in our mouth. We've gone through it as well. She's 16 years old and she's taking a razor blade and she's cutting herself all the way up to her arm in a 106 degree temperature August weather. She's wearing turtlenecks and she's wearing long sweaters to cover up the marks. And as a dad, I'm sitting there watching her go up and get a seven year coin and on the inside, Brother Peter, And today, no, they're not here. And no, they're not at Grace. They're down in Modesto. And her husband is preaching two services, one at 10 for the Spanish church and one at 12 for the English church. Devil, you thought you had one, but you, you lost that one because she's not damaged goods. There's a song that says, Something about hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Anybody ever hear that song? 
I love that song. I play that thing loud and proud and roll the windows down because you're looking at a guy right here 41 years ago. The devil had me, but today I'm free, and he that the Son is set free is free indeed. The devil may look at you as damaged goods, but God doesn't look at you as damaged goods. I don't know where I'm at in time, Sister Bracken, but come on. From the time that Mephibosheth sat at the king's table to the time he died, that's where he sat. He sat at the king's table. Simon Peter, Jesus looked at him and said, come follow me. Simon Peter watched him. Simon Peter saw him open blinded eyes. Simon Peter saw Jesus reach and touch a withered hand. Simon Peter watched individuals as they were raised from the dead and Jesus spoke to them. But when Jesus needed Simon Peter in the worst way in the world, Simon was nowhere to be found. You ever been there? Oh, you don't have to confess. I will. I've been there. And I'm a preacher. I've been there. Brother Rash, I've had individuals look at me and say, what do you do? Because Pete, I didn't tell them, I'm a pastor. You know what I told them? I teach at a Bible college. That's what I told them. Was it a lie? Nope. It wasn't. Sister Sullivan, I just didn't want them to know what I really did. Because damaged goods like me, how's anybody going to ever understand that? Damaged goods. I'm a Bible college instructor. I saw that individual later on. I can't remember how long ago. And I walked up to that individual and said, you ask me a question, what I did. I said, and I gave you an answer that was true, but let me tell you what I really do. I'm a preacher of the gospel. Because we think that they'll turn us away. We think that because we were damaged goods, they're just going to walk away from us. Because I don't have the right name. I don't drive the right car. I don't visit the same people you've, you've damaged goods. Peter watches Jesus go through everything he goes through. Everything. And after they're done beating him, he's in Pilate's hall or on his way to be beaten. Now, Jesus looked at him and said, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Before it crows one time, you'll deny me three times. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes through after it all happens. And he looks at Peter. And Peter looks at him. And the Bible says he walks away sorrowfully. He's standing there. Being a fisherman is not the most lucrative thing in the world. And if you look at all the disciples and apostles, whatever you want to call them, that Jesus called, they were a motley bunch. We think that they were super spiritual. Read about them. They weren't. They were clamoring, trying to get on top of each other, so to speak, a rung up on the ladder. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? You got a 17-year-old boy who's got some daddy issues over here fighting against an individual that's 50 years old over here. Come on, read about it. It's there. And the individual that Jesus banked on at that point, blanked on him. He goes out there and he's warming his hands by the wrong fire. That's a message in and of itself. He's warming his hands by the wrong fire. And they looked at him and said, we know you. You're one of those followers of Jesus. Not me. 
Not me. He's standing there. Yeah. We, we saw you with Jesus. Not me. And just to fit in the crowd, sometimes we do some dumb things. And just to fit in his crowd at that point, he curses at that point. See, I'm not part of that. And now all of a sudden, the rooster crows. The rooster crows at that point. And Jesus looks at Peter. And Peter knows and remembers exactly what he says. And the Bible says he walks away sorrowfully. Keep reading. Don't stop now. Keep reading. Keep reading. We stop right there and say, Loser! Damn good! No good to the kingdom of God! No good to anybody! Jesus raises from the grave on the third day, and this is what he says. Go tell my disciple and the damaged good one. what he says go tell my disciples and Peter he still had a purpose for Peter's life even though Peter was damaged goods and it was the damaged goods one that preached Pentecost not John not James not all the rest of them it was the damaged good ones that preached Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. What are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is that I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what anybody else has ever said. In the eyes of God, you are not damaged goods. You are not damaged goods. As we stand... For a year, I stayed in contact with this guy right here. Through an app that was of the devil. Because it kept crashing. I'll never forget it. Sitting right there on a Wednesday night, you looked at me and said, I've got to go away for a little while. Oh, this is not telling tales out of school. This is a testimony that you need to hear. You need to hear. Because when we come to God, there are some things that we've done in the past that sometimes we have to take care of. But just because we have to take care of it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Sometimes he doesn't take us out of the storm. Sometimes he leads us through the storm. And he sat on that platform with me and said, I've got to go away for a while. I said, how long? He said, about 14 months. It was 12. And he kept a log every day, even though that app would crash. He kept a log every day and he would type me out a note every day. Every day. And when it was working, I would type him back a note. And we kept in contact. He did that not only with me, but several of the brethren here in this church. And they kept in contact with him. Society looked at him and said, damage goods. God saying, don't call anything unclean that which I have cleansed. He came to this altar, repented of his sins, was filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. And just because you had to go away for a little while doesn't mean you're damaged goods at all. And I'll never forget coming home, him coming home and sitting right over here, sitting in a black suit. Somebody walked, one of the young people walked up to me, new young people, and they said, Pastor, said, we, we think we got a, a pastor here in the church. I said, show me who that pastor is. They showed me it was Brother... Rick Burdue. 
I said, yeah, he's going to make a good pastor one of these days. I mean it. I mean it. I look around this auditorium today. Sergio, I talk about you. I talk about Rick and Cedar. Let me just speak to somebody here. You have been faithful in this church. Over and over and over and over. I start looking around. And I start seeing people in this church that mean so much to me personally. And you've been an example to Sister Bishop and I over the years. God didn't bring you from out there, so to speak. Maybe you don't have a story like Rick Berdu or a Sergio or somebody else that's here today. You have your own testimony. But some of you have the testimony that you never went out there, thank God. But you stayed right in here and showed us what it was like to live for God. But that still doesn't mean that we don't go through it. And the devil doesn't look at us and say, you're, not da you're, you're damaged goods. I look at you right now, Andrew, and I pray to God, you never go out into the world. There's nothing out there for you. You don't have to go out there and have a testimony and bring it back into the church and tell the church about it. Your testimony is that you have always been in the house of God. Where's she at? There she is. Right there. You. You in the white sweater. Miss Kylie. She's a senior this year. She's a student body president this year. She's got her hands full. She's got a lot going on in her life. She's always been in the church. She's got an incredible heritage. Not only you, but your mother, brother-in-law, family, you got a sister that, uh, an aunt that goes to this church as well. Josie, a great heritage in this church. A great heritage in Pentecost. But there are times that these young people, they go through it. You don't realize what they go through because some of you don't deal with what they dealt with. The pressures of having sexual relations in college and in high school. And if you don't do it, then you're not part of the team, not part of the crowd. And these young people are saying, then I'm not part of the crowd because I'm part of God's crowd. And people ostracize them and push them away. You let me tell you something, sweetheart. I'm proud of you and all of heaven is proud of you for what you're doing. This church is could be called a church full of damaged goods. And I gave it a title for damaged goods, but you're not damaged goods. You're the apple of God's eye. And God's eye is upon you. And God's purpose is in your heart and in your life. We walk away sometimes, then we come back, just like the prodigal did. And he comes back, but here's what I like about that entire story. What I like about that entire story, the Sam, is that the father was always looking for him. He never stopped looking for him. We like to rejoice that he came home. Father never gave up that he would ever come home. Scripture doesn't tell us this, but I'm a father. And if I had a wayward child, I know how I would be. I would always be looking down that road, waiting for the world's damaged goods to come home. Oh, I know what it feels like to have your daughter accosted and almost raped. She tells the story herself. She's 18 years old. And she's taken her friend home. 
And while she's taking her friend home, there's another young man in the car. I know I'm on tape and I'm being very discreet. And her best friend's mom said, you bring my daughter home first. Well, my girls have always known you are never in a car with a boy by yourself. I'm old fashioned that way. And I don't apologize. But she said, dad, I didn't know what to do. And when that young lady left her car, it was just her and that boy. And that boy got her mixed up in North West Stockton. She didn't know where she was. And then he pounced on her and tried to rape my daughter. She got away from him and kicked him out of the car. And then she came home damaged goods. And for years, my little girl dealt with that over and over and over. Nobody will ever want me. I'm damaged goods. Nobody will ever marry me. I'm damaged goods. Nobody wants anything to do with me. I'm a loose girl, they're going to say. She looked at me and she said, Dad, I'm just not worth it. And I'm going, oh, yes, you are. There's individuals in this church, and you believed in her. And yesterday, she and her husband were at Community West. He is the office manager of the Western District. They've got a beautiful little boy. God's raising them up. And on the inside, I'm singing, Hell lost another one, she is free. She is free. Hell lost another one, she is free. She is free. <laughs> to whom the Son is set free, he is free indeed, the Bible says. <laughs> so I'm here to tell somebody here today, you're not here by chance. You're here by the divine will of Almighty God. You are not damaged goods. You are a child of God. You hear me, somebody? You are a child of God. And as a child of God, you can stand boldly and come boldly. Hebrews tells us that I can come boldly into the throne room of God and I can bring my petitions to God. And God pushes all of heaven and hell aside to come right to where I'm at. So here's how I want to end this service. And I'm the first one down here. Because there are times I feel like I'm damaged goods. There are times that the devil whispers in our ear, Brother David, and reminds us of what we've always done in the past. But I like the old cliche, is it? When the devil reminds you of the, your past, you remind him of his future. If you ever felt like you were damaged goods, come on down and join me. Come on down. Just get as close as you can. Come on down. This is what God likes. God likes honesty. God, there are times the bowler just feel like damaged goods. And God looks back and says, don't you dare call anything unclean and common that which I have cleansed. How many got the Holy Ghost here today? Come on, you got the Holy Ghost here. Raise your hand. God doesn't put his spirit in junk. Hear me now. God doesn't put his spirit in junk. 
God puts his spirit in men and women that he has called. And not only has God called some men and women here, but God's called some young people here right now. And God's calling some hyphen right now. Because some of you have an inferiority complex about who you are and where you're, what your name is and where you come from. When the name of Jesus Christ was washed over you in baptism, you are no longer your own. You are his then. And as his, your, his name is applied to your life. Hear me. His name is applied to your life. And the devil can't do anything to you unless he gets permission from God first. There's three things that will condemn you. The first one is your heart. Your heart. The second one is the devil. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So why are we going to trust our heart in the first place? The second one is the devil. The Bible says he's a father of lies. Why are we going to believe him? God is looking at some of you and saying, I want to give you a do-over this morning. Hear me. You come in here today with a heavy heart. And God is going to lift that heavy heart and give you a purpose by the time this is over. You walked in here and you feel like you're empty on the inside. And the devil has stolen everything from you. I'm here to tell somebody today, God's about to give that all back to you today. Because you're not damaged goods. You're not damaged goods. We go through things in our life, but we're not damaged goods. And so I look at individuals today, and I'm going, today is a do-over day. I look here today, and there's a couple men that I have gone golfing with. And all of a sudden, if they don't like the shot, they're going to take a mulligan. Some of you golfers know what that's all about. We, that's not played in the PGA. That's played in backyard golf. Well, I'm smiling today because I'm looking at individuals that God is going to touch your life and do something supernatural in your life. Do I believe that there are preachers in this building? Yes. Do I believe that there are other pastors in this building? Yes, I do. I do. But the devil and, and, and the world has looked at you and says, I remember, and God says, I don't remember because they were baptized in Jesus' name and all things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So as they begin to sing this song, this is what I want us to do. I don't want you to think about all the things that you were told, things that went wrong, all that other kind of stuff. You're not damaged goods. I want you to lift your hands and I want you to start claiming the promises of God. Listen to me. Start claiming the promises of God right now. Maybe you're here right now and, and things didn't work out well for you last night. Start claiming the promises of God right here, right now. Right here, right now. God, long time ago, you said that I would do dot, 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 and dot. God, long time ago, you said that I would be involved in this, and Lord, it hasn't happened. Where's the promise at, God? I'm going to live in that promise because I'm not damaged goods. You have a purpose in my life. You have a purpose in my life, just like you did Mephibosheth, and just like you did the adulterous woman and Simon Peter and the prodigal son. Lord, I've come home. I'm not damaged goods. Come on, lift your voice right now, beloved. Lift your voice right now.